First of all, uh, I'm delighted that Colonel Simon Diggins, who's a defence analyst, has joined me. Um, Simon, thank you very much for your time. I just want to get your reaction, first of all, to this news about a, a, a vessel linked to Israel apparently being seized. Now, the Iranians say it's been seized. The Israelis say it has been seized. Um, the spokesman Daniel Hagari says, Iran will bear consequences for choosing to escalate the situation any further situation any further. Israel is on high alert. We have increased our readiness to protect Israel from further further Iranian aggression. We are also prepared to respond. That is serious stuff, Simon. What's your assessment of the breaking news in the last few minutes from uh, Iran and Israel? Um, it, as you say, quite right, Peter, this is very serious news. It's one of the things that we'd be most concerned about from almost from the beginning of October 7th, October the 8th, the way in which the current conflict in Gaza might spread out into more wider regional consequences. Uh, we've seen it in the fighting that took place in, inside uh, Iraq, where there have been, there'd been various uh, attacks and counterattacks, and in Syria, indeed. And most recently, we had the, the Israeli attack on, a, on, on an Iranian consulate, so an embassy, a diplomatic building, uh, inside, uh, inside uh, Damascus itself albeit one that was hiding and and covering up for um, IRGC generals who were probably conducting campaigns against Israel. What the Iranians now seem to have done is seized on this vessel. Interesting, it's not actually an Israeli flagged vessel. It's a Portuguese flagged vessel, but it appears to be owned by an Israeli billionaire uh, who, who runs a company called the, the Zodiac Group. And on that basis, the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, have seized that, that vessel and the reports I've, I've read, and these are from Israeli sources, uh, they are planning to take it into an Iranian port. Now, this might just be the response, if you like, to their attack onto the, the, the consulate, uh, or it might be something wider as well. But as you rightly point out, um, it does indicate that the potential regional conflict, which we've all been very wary of and been very concerned about, might now be about to happen. What do you think we can read, if anything? It might be absolutely nothing, Simon, but given that this is, this is a Portuguese vessel, it's owned by an Israeli billionaire, as you've just said there. Is there a degree of separation there that we should read into in this, or do, do you think it just happened to be in the area and this was a, a convenient thing for Iran? It's probably impossible to know. Maybe that's an unfair question, Simon, but I just, no. I, I just wonder if we can read into that in any way. Um, I think what we can say is the Iranians have been monitoring uh, traffic, not just in the, in, the, in the Straits of Hormuz, but also, you recall, in the Red Sea. Uh, one of the things that happened prior to the, uh, uh, the uh, American and British attack on the Houthi rebels, there was, they were given basically warning to the Iranians to get out of the area, because what the Iranians had in the area, uh, they had spy ships. Uh, who are monitoring the traffic, and some of this traffic is, is you know, you can monitor it relatively easily. Indeed, there are people who 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 do so, but they were they were they were being monitored by Iranian spy ships. The Iranian spy ships then disappeared. But what it does indicate is that the 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 Iranians have been monitoring traffic, uh, and therefore they've identified this as a potential target, uh, and and are seen now to have done something about it. What happens now? Is this a diplomatic effort to try to get Iran to give the vessel back? What, what, who's involved with that? What, what, are, what, what are the conversations that will be going on behind the scenes, Simon? Uh, well, the first one probably is to try and stop this from being spreading into a, into a regional conflict. And interesting, people like the Americans have been, uh, uh, have through, as they say, the usual channels, have been trying to ensure this does not turn into a wider diplomatic uh, uh, attack. Um, and they will now be working through people like the Qataris and others to try and control this and to limit limit what actually happens in terms of response. How much influence the Americans actually have, though, either over the Iranians, which is always going to be indirect, in or even over the Israelis, is very moot. Um, and I think the 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 attack on the on the consulate, however irritating it was to to Israel to have the these IRGC generals effectively being hidden by the by by the by diplomatic protection, I suspect the Americans and indeed they were were taken surprise in surprise by that mm. and they made it clear to the Iranians they were not involved in any way with the targeting and the actual attack itself so they're quite keen as well this does not spread into in, into into that so i think it's now as you say a matter of of negotiations back channel conversations through people like the Qataris other people who are talking to both sides the Emiratis the Omanis people like that who have got who have got open conversations with Israel and also have open conversations with the Iranians and see whether they can negotiate a, a, a peaceful solution to this. Uh, because one of the things the Iranians are threatened to do is to close the Straits of Hormuz. And that would be disastrous in terms of world trade. Whatever we lost in terms of the closing of the Red Sea, you can, you can, you know, you can buy a factor 
the, the effect of closing the Straits of Hormuz, which would be very easy to do. There does need to be that sense of free movement in the Straits of Hormuz. Um, that that is that is a threat. I mean, now that in terms of terms of the what, what they what they what they could they could do uh, in terms of oil, in terms of all sorts of supplies going through there, uh, the Iranians could easily close it if they so wished. Um, tell me a little bit about where you think this. Uh, I mean, I suppose a, a better question is how optimistic are you that this can be solved diplomatically without any loss of life, without this getting into a regional conflict and, and the horrible things that would follow and loss of life that would follow with that. Yeah, that's a really hard question, Peter, but it's a fair question. I mean, I think we're, we're, we are kind of at the 50-50 point at the moment. You know, whether or not we can keep this under control, uh, whether it seems part of the, part of a, you know, part of, if you like this dialogue by force that's going on between Iran and uh, uh, and Israel. Um, and and they, this is this is seen as the response to the attack on the, on the Iranian consulate, or whether it becomes original is moot. Uh, and it does depend on people's reactions. It has to be said from the perspective of the Israelis that in a curious way, they actually welcome a regional conflict. They don't necessarily welcome the casualties and the consequences of it, but actually having a regional conflict then makes sure that, sure, that America is drawn in on their side. Is, if, you know, America has said very clearly, and, and so have we, that, that the security of Israel is, is paramount and really important, and that must continue. But the, the hope would always have been that they would, they would agree with us, that they should not allow this to be a widening conflict. Uh, the, the thing is that the, I don't think the Israelis are playing by the same rules, uh, and they are prepared to conduct operations which endanger the regional conflict, knowing that they will not themselves necessarily fulfill, have to deal with the full consequences, but others, the Americans particularly, will have to do so. So it, you know, this is the case of the tail wagging the dog in terms of this attack on the consulate and now the Iranian response. It makes it very difficult, if you like, to hold the ring which is what everyone is hoping we can do. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, I, it, it's a, a coincidence that you were to come on, actually, to talk about Trident just as that news came out. So I really appreciate your expertise on that. I've learned a lot from our conversation. On, on the issue we got you on to talk about, um, I wouldn't say I'm against Trident. I wouldn't say it, I, would, I would scrap it immediately. And actually, I think maybe this is... maybe the, I, I, I don't know whether I should express this, but I'm about to. Um, I think Trident is my view, and please tell me yours. But my view is that I wouldn't scrap Trident. I don't think it's. I don't think. It's, I don't think we shouldn't have a nuclear deterrent necessarily. But I do wonder about the about the, the wisdom of putting so much time, effort, money, and resource into something that is probably never going to be used. Um, hopefully, it'll never be used. Um, but the deterrent aspect is, of course, part of it. But my view is that Trident's a bit like the royal family in that it's so much part of Britain and it's so much part of our sort of national fabric that actually to remove ourselves from it would be far more uh, trouble than it would be worth. Um, it, uh, that might be a slightly weird opinion, but that's not the that's where I'm coming from. And I think when we've had the uh, rocket firing recently that didn't work and so on, people are a little bit sceptical about it, although lots of our viewers and listeners are telling me I'm absolutely wrong. Tell me why I'm wrong, Simon. Um, well, I think you're right to be sceptical about whether it works or not as a system. Um, you know, we've, we've had two firings, test firings in the last eight years, one earlier on this year where the missile just plopped back into the into the sea and one in 2016 where the missile went rogue. Uh, luckily, it had no warhead on it, but it went rogue and had to be destroyed actually over Texas of all places. So, you know, if you ask me, do we have at the moment a credible at sea nuclear deterrent? I've got to put a big question mark out and say, actually, I'm not sure we have. We have brilliant submariners. I'm sure the engineers are the first class in the world. We know the missile works being fired from different submarines, from the American and Ohio class submarines, but that combination of the system at the moment, does that work? question mark so there is there's that question mark the other question mark is how much of the money has been spent on this compared to other issues that could be spent on in terms of our defense we have a significant problem in europe at moment we have a, a dictator putin who has has talked about existential threats coming from coming from nato we have the prime ministers of estonia latvia lithuania and poland we have the head of nato both the civil and military head of nato warning that Russia could attack us in three to five years. We will still have something like a credible nuclear deterrent in three to five years, but we do not have the conventional forces to deter that attack. Mm. So if you ask me where the priority should be, the money should now be being spent not on developing a, a system which may come into operation at some time in the 2035, 2040 timeframe, but ensuring that we have a credible conventional defense in order to attack a clear and present danger. You know, And it's not me saying that. These are mm. prime ministers who are saying yes. it. 
appears the present danger from, from Russia. And the person who's probably going to be the Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, as well. He was in Barrow and Furness. Uh, he, is the, he is to promise nuclear deterrent, a bedrock of his security plan. Final question, Simon, on, on, uh, on Trident. I mean, how important is it for Britain as a country, do you think, to be a nuclear power, to have that nuclear deterrent? We've heard about the threats that are there, not least from Keir Starmer and others, but also just for our sort of standing as a nation to be a nuclear power. Is that important? I mean, the, the, the whole essence about the nuclear deterrent is essentially psychological. I mean, you go back to the origins of it right at the very beginning. You know, the, the, then a Labour foreign secretary saying, you know, do not send you know, send a foreign British foreign secretary into into the councils of Europe naked. So it's seen as as a part of that. I think people would be more impressed with us if we could actually deliver on all the other things we're supposed to be doing. You know, so if we had a credible military force that could deploy into the Baltic uh, to, 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 to deter that, I think people are more interested. It's very interesting the way the Russians look at us. I mean, when they, the Russians rolled out their latest missile system, which is aptly called Satan, uh, and they, look, they, they had a sort of promotional video that went with it, which is quite horrific, but basically it had them basically attacking a country on the western side, uh, the islands, of, the islands of, of the Western Isles. Um, and, you know, we were the target. And we're the target because we talk large, we talk big, but we're not actually carrying the big stick. Now, we need that big stick. And, and Keir Starmer, actually, while he talked about having the, the nuclear turn, said absolutely nothing about conventional defence. Both he and the Tory party are basically saying the same thing, 2.5% when they can get the money to yeah. do that. Not good enough. Simply not good enough. Simon, thank you. I've learned a lot from this interview. I think you're my favourite guest today. Um, thank you very oh, much indeed, Colonel. Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> Colonel Simon Diggins there.